Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. This is going to be one of the, the episodes that I'm going to remember for a long time because I get to talk to a, to an old friend, Mr. Sarab Bakshi. He used to work for Electrical Equipment Company a while back, and now he is a manufacturing engineer at a company called Intuitive Surgicals in California. So we are definitely doing this podcast via phone call and looking forward to talking to you, to my buddy. Sarab, how are you doing today, man? I'm doing great, Chris. Thank you. Thanks for having me on this. Oh, man. It was a, it was a great opportunity to get to talk to you again and getting to do it uh, in front of people. That's just awesome. Well, I think uh, our listeners are going to really enjoy this. We've had a, a lot of fun together over the years, and you have an interesting story, and you're at a really cool company now in manufacturing, and, and that's kind of for, for the Eco Ask Why listeners. You know, we focus this in on manufacturing in, in America and, and the the young people and the, the people in general that are out there that want to to better their careers and know more about what's going on in manufacturing. So you're you're per, you're perfect, man, as normal to uh, to join mm-hmm. us, buddy. So why don't, to start us off, why don't you just tell our listeners a little bit about your journey to, to where you're at now, man? Because you, you've definitely had several different really interesting roles throughout your career. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so um, my background is in mechanical engineering. Um, I have an undergraduate and a master's. And what really got me into mechanical engineering is I love the way how things work. And I love to take them apart and put them back together. Um, I've been in different roles uh, in my in my in my career. I've been a, a mechanical engineer. I've been a failure analysis engineer. I've been in in, in a quality role at Eco, um, and now I'm a manufacturing engineer at Intuitive Surgicals. And I've been in all these different roles, and every role has taught me something that you know it's made me what I am today, honestly. And I don't think any of these previous opportunities were a mistake. It's just it took me a while to realize what I really want to do and where I want to be. And each of these roles has helped me get closer to that goal uh, in life. Yeah. So um, that is, that, that, uh, that kind of tells me, that kind of explains where I am and what got me here. What got me towards uh, intuitive, especially is it's, it's a company that I've heard about since I was in high school my mom's a gynecologist, and I've heard her talk about the challenges she faced in, in laparoscopic surgeries and the things that she would like to improve in these surgical instruments. And Intuitive is, is, is probably one of the biggest companies in the world that does robotic surgeries, uh, that develops robotic uh, surgical equipment that doctors all over the world use for making people's lives better and improving patient outcomes. And, you know, it's, it's great to work for a company that uh, has the patient and the doctor as their biggest focus. So, yeah, I think that, that would be, so you would kind of define that as that's their purpose, right? Is to focus in on the patient to be as least intrusive as possible and to deliver yep. the most desirable outcome of that surgery. Is that kind of a quick summary? That's exactly it. Nice, man. That is awesome. I mean, and, and to be able to work for a company that you know the purpose, and not just that you know the purpose, right, but, like, you're behind it, that it, you align with that purpose, that, that's got to be awesome, Sarab. It is, that's a great feeling. I'll tell you that. Now, I'm sure, you know, the surgical robotic industry is, is like every other industry, although it is pretty specialized. I'm sure there are a lot of challenges that are that it's faced with. What do you see as some of the greatest challenges that that industry has over the next five years or so? I mean, I'd say uh, the biggest challenges are getting people to believe that, you know, surg- uh, like surgical robots can actually help get them home better, uh, sooner, you know, faster. Because a lot of times there are challenges to people 
adopting this technology because it seems i mean, just think about it if you're going under surgery you're either is you're nervous and if someone tells you that there's this really neat new method where um, they can help you get your life back on track sooner you always want to know exactly how it works right and surgical robotics can seem complicated and challenging but you know honestly if if you are open to accepting new technology i think it 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 seems very simple um and honestly i i'm not in a role where i can talk about the challenges for this industry in depth but that is just my take is adopting any new technology takes time you know you have to go through those initial phases where people start adopting it to a higher extent right and i'm sure you'll see the same thing in in any industry right you have something new that comes up and it takes time to get people convinced um especially if it's an expensive piece of equipment right no doubt now now there's the challenges on the floor itself cuz you know for our listeners mate you you're the manufacturing engineer so you're in the plant every day working with this equipment right yep so what are what those I, challenges be just just curious it's you know just making sure i mean when you especially when you're working with uh, equipment like a surgical robot you want to make sure that anything that you're building anything that you are pushing out of your manufacturing facility adheres to the strictest of standards because at this point you're play, you're playing people's lives right and you want to make sure that you don't cut any corners and uh, when you have a company like intuitive that supports and ensures that every piece of equipment is built without any compromises uh, it kind of makes your life a little bit easier where you don't have to sacrifice in quality but the biggest challenge i would say is making sure that you know you double check everything making sure nothing escapes your inspection points um and i think being in 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 a quality role before kind of helps me with that right it would put you in a mentality where you don't want to cut any corners you know and yeah. you want to stick to any regulations because i still remember at eco how we would follow all the ieee or epri standards just to make sure that anything that we are building any uh, motors that we're servicing and before we sell them you, they don't fail unexpectedly right you want to make sure that the faith that your customer has put in you is justified right so have you been able to t- I'm just curious to take some of the 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 skills that you learn you know while you're a quality you know you were a quality manager at eco over all of our service divisions and apply them to intuitive Yeah, uh absolutely. Um I mean every time that I think about what I've done in my previous roles, um Intuit stands as I mean obviously it, it was literally the previous role before this, so it's always really fresh in my mind, but I also learned a lot working at Eco because that's the first time that I'm working with uh, in, in a quality role and I get to interface with customers and I get to explain to them why their failures keep recurring or why they have unexpected failures or their lifetime isn't what they were what they thought it would be and how we can help them i always have that frame of mind when i make any decision in my in my current job so you know being at eco was one of the best roles that i've been in where first of all it was one of the first roles where i actually interfaced with with customers directly and i got to see their challenges first and i got to explain to them and share some of the the knowledge that we had accumulated at eco uh, with all our uh, rigorous data logging and all our root cause analysis and failure analysis reports that we've put together so yeah it definitely helps absolutely man let's talk about you know, maybe some 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 projects that are making you excited right now what what projects get you excited that you're working on right now sir um so being at intuitive it it get gets it allows me to work with well especially at intuitive but also being in the bay area uh you get to see a lot more technology being implemented sooner than on the east coast so a lot of things are changing and there's a lot of challenges and the, i think some of the key projects that uh get me excited right now are you know getting to work on on improvements that make our product better that make building our product easier 
So it helps our end customers, which is patients, by putting out better product. It helps my technicians if I make the process easier. Uh, and I get to work on a lot of these projects using really cool technology. So, Saurabh, thank you for that. But let's let's shift here and let's talk about, you know, we have a lot of listeners to EcoSY who, who are trying to get into industry or trying to figure out their career paths and where they want to go, right? And, you know, you've been a quality engineer. You have the mechanical engineering background. Of course, we won't hold that against you here at Ecos. That's It's fine. We'll st- we still love you because you're, uh, because you're an ME buddy. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe there isn't the the young professional out there and they they'd like to be a manufacturing engineer one day or they'd like to be a quality engineer what are some advice that you'd offer up that's to someone that wanted to enter uh this industry um from my personal experience i'd say that number 1 it's it's okay to take your time to understand what you want to do in life right a lot of people a lot of times people get upset when they get into a role that they don't like. But it's a learning curve, right? You, there's nothing... I mean, I'm really envious of people who know exactly what they want to do in life because I never knew what I wanted to do uh, right from the very beginning. I had an idea what I enjoyed doing and I stuck along those guidelines. But a lot of my roles were things that I learned and things that helped me get to my ultimate goal, you know? So... Take every opportunity as a le- as a learning experience and give your best shot at it. Just because you're in a job that you didn't expect uh, what it would be when you took it on doesn't mean that you need to give up on it. I mean, you give it your best uh, and you try to learn as much as you can from it in life. So that's one thing. The second thing I'd say is Take your time with things. There's no rush. You have plenty of time in life, you're, especially if you're you know, early in your career. Take as much time as you want to decide what you want to do. As long as you're doing your best, as long as you're giving it your best shot, life eventually takes you to the right destination. Don't focus on the money. Don't focus on where you'll get in life. Just enjoy what you're doing every day. Because the, the, the thing that I live by is you spend at least 8 to 10 hours of your awake life every day at work. So of the 24 hours you get every day, you spend 8 hours sleeping. So half of your awake life you spend at work. And you'd rather be happy with what you do for the half of your life. Because, you know, that's going to affect your other half when you get back home. You know, just just enjoy what you're doing. And if you don't enjoy that's fine. As long as you've given it your best shot, try, try to find something else that you enjoy. That's right. Don't settle. I mean, that's that's great advice, Sarah. I mean, it's something I've been personally blessed with as we, as we were talking about, you know, prior to, to, to starting this episode, you know, the, the many different roles at Eco, but it, they've all been fun. They've all been challenging, but you know, I do, I'm very blessed. I get to wake up every morning and enjoy what I'm doing and you know, you, just, you can't really put a uh, you know dollar value on that. You know, because you're right. We spend a lot of time at work, don't we, buddy? Yeah, we did. <laughs> you do, and you know, any job you do is important, right? Like every every job in the world is important because you play a role. You're the one who's doing that that job at that time, and you need to do your best at it, right? Because at the end of the day, when you go to go to sleep, you need to think about how you spent your day. And you need to decide if the day you spent was good or bad. And if you don't give it your best shot, you're never going to get an answer that the day you spent was, you never. You, you don't want to settle for an okay day, right? You want to say that, yeah, today I accomplished something. How many, how much ever uh, marginal of, an, of a goal it could be, but you want to say that, okay, I set a goal and I did something good today and I'm happy with it. You know, because mm-hmm. that's what really counts at the end of the day is, you need to make sure that yourself, you're pleased with what you've done for the day. It doesn't care. You don't care about what anyone else thinks. You need to decide if you yourself are happy with your progress. Right. Absolutely, man. Now, as people develop and as you've developed, you know, we're trying to to, to point uh, our listeners to ideas and, and places to, for them to grow professionally in their careers. What are some resources that that helped you along the way that you may put as a recommendation to our listeners as, hey, this group over here or or this this you know 
piece of information over here really helped me. Would, would there be anything there that you like to offer up? Uh, yeah. Um, a lot of times people think that just having a degree is all that matters. But um, honestly, I think I learned more from from the different jobs I've done than I have in school. Um, so having a degree isn't all that matters, honestly. If you're really good at what you do, that should be enough to take you anywhere in, in your life. I, I do know that, uh, yes, to get your door in, you do need a degree, but don't focus on school. You need to have an idea of what you're good at and build on those strengths. I've always known that I'm more of a hands-on person. I'm not very strong technically, but I, I like to know how things work and I, I like to look at them myself. You know, Learning something from a book isn't something that teaches me. So knowing that, um, I don't know if you remember about this, but uh, one of the stories I told you was when I, ha- when, I was a, when I was growing up as a kid, I had a, uh, I had a moped that I used to ride around and I wanted to know how it worked. So, you know, one day I took the whole thing apart and it kind of pissed my mom off because I had this huge mess in the middle of the house uh, and there was grease and oil everywhere. And, you know, that really taught me how an engine works and how to put it back together. And I struggled putting it back together, but it's something that taught me really well. And if, if you are good at something, and I think that uh, will definitely take you somewhere in life. Now, didn't you on that moped, we can't just leave that man. Did, didn't you, <laughs> you, you built, you took it apart, right? And was yeah. that in the house you did that? I did that in the house. Yes. <laughs> in the um, living room, like the main room of the house. Kinda. Yes. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and uh, yeah, so this was back in India, and it was a really old moped, and uh, growing up, we didn't have a lot of room in the house, and, you know, I, I did the best I could with what with, with whatever tools I had and whatever space I had, and I ended up taking it apart and understanding it, and I, when it, it's, it's very different when you take things apart, uh, but when you start putting things back together, you're either left with too few parts or too many parts and either of them are yeah, either of them are not a good sign <laughs> that's right so yeah so uh, yeah I, I had to get help from a local garage that was close to my house and i got this guy to help me out and uh, you know i think he was one of my first mentors to be honest uh, he had no reason to help me out uh, but he saw that i was interested and this was a trade and like this was a skill trade, and I had no background. This was when I was in probably in my first year of undergraduate. And uh, in India, you don't grow up fixing your own things. You have people do it for you because labor is cheaper. So I had no, I definitely no idea how to fix it. Fix the moped back together into a working piece, working condition. But yeah, this guy really, he was nice enough to sit down and explain how to put things back together and why applying torque is important. So that was, I mean, even before I knew what torque was and how you set your torque values, he gave me a practical experience on how to use a torque wrench and adjust torque values and why torque is important and why you need to use Loctite and why cleaning pistons is important. You know, all the basic things that I use in my day-to-day life now, I learned it when I was, uh, just because I was interested in knowing how things work. Right. I I always love that story, man. And you kind of, you mentioned that he was one of your first mentors and we definitely like to take this opportunity, you know, on these shows to, to give our listeners a chance to hear and, and, and for our guests a chance to, you know, give those shout outs to potential uh, mentors that they've had throughout their careers. So is there anybody you like to recognize, man, that is, is, is really helping, you know, along your way and to, to develop into the, uh, to the man you are now? Uh, yeah, it's been, I mean, obviously, I don't think anyone has one mentor in their life, right? You have different people in your different phases that guide you along the way and keep make sure that you're on the right right track. Um, and for that, I think my, my biggest mentor is my mom because she's always encouraged me to do what I like. She's never, she's she's always been very encouraging and whatever I am today is because of her, you know, especially growing up and like, for you, you'll know, Chris, you have kids. You'll know how difficult it is when you have to send your kids um, uh, away 
to pursue their education and this was 3000 miles away when she allowed me to uh, come here for my for my for my masters so she i would say is my biggest mentor uh, then i like i said i've had different mentors in my life i definitely remember the guy who helped me put back my my moped together let's call him moped guy <laughs> uh the next up was when i finished my school i had my first job out of school was in a company called brooker and the guy who hired me um his name is bill muller he could see that i was struggling as a, as a mechanical engineer cuz um like i said i had no idea what i wanted to do in life and he encouraged me to find what i wanted to do and he told me that um it's okay for you to take this opportunity to learn about what mechanical engineering is and um, if you don't like it that's fine so i want to give him a shout out and uh, next up is this guy called chris granger who hired me at eco oh come on now yeah uh, you get a big shout out because we had a, a lot of projects that we worked on together and uh, you talked me about i you remember when we when we started uh, when i started working i had i had no idea what eco was about and Uh, it was a totally new feel for me and you gave me the chance to sit down and learn and understand uh what we do at eco and you had you put enough faith in me to agree with what i said uh most of the times um uh, you know you challenged me so that helped me question myself and make sure that whatever i'm saying is 100% correct and i'm not you know making any mistakes and i really the the biggest shout out you get is for your management style because you showed me what a good manager is because i had the opportunity to work with the qa team at eco and you knew that i was struggling initially but i learned about how to manage people from you honestly um, and how to work with people because i'd never managed people before that and you to you i mean I, looking at you i think that was a great inspiration for me so yeah you get a big shout out we also talked a lot on on the on a personal level and i learned a lot about um i was newly married when i moved to eco and i learned a lot about how to communicate with with my wife cuz that is a big change in anyone's life getting married and i don't think anyone is prepared for that to be honest um so talking to you help me with uh, with uh, my my personal life as well um i don't know if you remember but you told me about this great book five ways of communicating i can't remember the title but do you the remember five, the uh, the five love languages yep exactly and uh, i think that was a great book and that was a great suggestion that helped me at a very critical time but to summarize all my mentors it's usually people i work with on a day to day level that inspire me to do better and looking at people i work with really you know i look up to them and what they do great that that's great rob and and thank you for the kind words that i can tell you man it that uh that that means a lot coming from you and and uh wow i got uh took my breath away with that one buddy so let's uh let's keep going with you know one thing that that you are and i think this you'll probably enjoy this people have preconceptions of engineers and you probably even had that when you were going going through engineering school as well and now yep. you've been in you know now you've been a qa you're now you know the manufacturing engineer what's a myth or something that, about our profession that you would like to debunk you know you got a chance to say you know what people think we do this but here's reality what what would that be I think the the easiest way to say this is engineering is all about common sense you know it's it's all about uh, having that right attitude in life about not being afraid of challenges because the word engineering comes from someone who is able to come up with an idea or a concept that makes things work you know so uh, a lot of people think that engineering is something that's really complicated that you need a lot of math that you need to apply fundamentals that you learn in school but you know to be honest it's all about you know having the right uh, mindset when you come across any challenge and you know engineering is all about learning and it could be learning from your mistakes every day in your life ev- i think everyone is an is an engin- engineer even if they don't have the degree because think about it in everyday life you have challenges where your car might break down uh, you have a flat 
and you have to fix it. And just doing that makes an engineer because you are working to overcome an obstacle in your life. And I think it's one of the easiest fields and one of the best fields, I think, if you enjoy solving challenges, if you enjoy solving problems, you know, you'd, you'd love being an engineer. And I think the world needs more engineers, to be honest, because I think it puts people in the right set of mind where you're not afraid to look at new new challenges. You're not afraid to use new ideas. You're, you're right. Yeah. I got, I, so I got a fun one here. So, okay. so, all right, so Rob, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw you a, a, a hypothetical question here because we all have budgets we have to work within, right, and, 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 yep. and constraints. But if you had an extra dollars uh, in a budget that, that you could spend on anything, you know, then we'll just keep it specific to, you know, the, the world, the working world, because there's a lot of things we could probably spend money on outside of that. But we'll just stay on oh, the yeah. working world. What would it be right now and why? So one one place where I would invest in in my in my current role is um, invest in tools that allow you to gather data and sift through data more effectively, right? Because uh, we've talked about this even at Eco that in in the next decade, in the next century, data is what's going to drive all your decisions. It's not going to be individual metrics, but it's going to be data across all your metrics that's going to help you make your decisions. And the age of paper and pen and keeping all that, all those records on, on physical copies is gone. No one does that anymore. And now you have all these companies that, are, that have all these stockpiles of data, but we, I, don't, I still don't see us having great tools to make sense out of all this data, right? Because data can be interpreted very differently by different people. So one place I would invest in is invest in tools that allows you to, you know, utilize this data to crunch this data a lot more effectively. Because all companies still, I think all the companies that we know still struggle with their data outputs. You're always, uh, you're either your data is incomplete or it's outdated. It's not current. It's not real time. So that's one place that I would, I would invest in, in any company is make your data real time. It helps you take, definitely it helps you with tactical decisions on the go, but having that data handy also helps you with your strategic decisions. It helps you plan for where your company wants, you want your company to be in the next year, five years, using data from the past, because that's your only, that, that's what you're building on going ahead. Right. Very good. Good point. You know, it's not just accessing data anymore you got to make sense of it right and that that's still yep. that's a gap man that is definitely a gap in industry and uh, that'd be a good place for investment for sure you know and, and just to kind of uh, one area i forgot to, to touch on with you is like fulfillment for you what makes you happy in your career in your job or is there a, like a story or a highlight of something that you've been a part of uh, it could have been, you know, at Intuitive, at Eco, at previous roles. Just curious on what maybe a highlight would be, and and what gives you the most joy out of each, you know, each part of your day. Um, I think in any of the jobs jobs that I've been in, like I said, I always like to think about what I've accomplished for the day. And you know, everyone has days where it's a slow day and you don't get much done. But I really look forward to days when I am really productive. And I remember days at Eco when. We used to go visit customers and we used to help them understand stuff. Like, So I, I remember the first day that I started at uh, Eco, uh, we went to uh, DAK and they we helped them walk through a failure that they had and we helped put a story together. And, you know, this is a story that you build on facts. It's not on some random data point. It's, it's actual facts that you put together and being in a role where I can use data to put together an effective story that, you know, helps people understand uh, concepts and helps them understand how things work and why things fail and how to prevent those failures is something that gives me a lot of fulfillment. And even in my current role, it's the same thing. I'm looking at, I, I get to put on that detective hat and sniff around and understand what all could have impacted a particular uh, outcome and use the information that I've gathered to, you know, build a story. That's something that I really enjoy doing. 
Absolutely. And you're good at it too, buddy. I mean, that is, that is one of your strengths, no doubt about it. Let's, let's shift a little bit outside of the work. We'll, we'll, we'll leave the, the, the work to decide for a minute. Let's, let's talk about you outside. So from a, from a hobby standpoint, what do you enjoy doing outside of, uh, on your personal time? Oh, you know about this too. It's, it's riding motorcycles. It's always, it always has been, uh, riding motorcycles and, Moving to California, one of the biggest things, one of the biggest reasons was I get to ride 12 months of the year. There's no downtime. I really enjoy doing that. More uh, like pretty much every weekend, I'm out on a ride somewhere. Um, and the great thing is, my wife rides motorcycles too, so she gets to come with me, and she likes spending time outdoors with me. So you know, I get to have the best of both worlds: be on a motorcycle and with my wife. So that shapes my weekend. I'm looking forward to weekends just for that one thing. What's now? What's if you had to? Do you have a personal highlight from a uh, motorcycle trip for where where you've been? Uh, yeah. So uh, last year we flew into Miami and rented motorcycles to go down to the Florida Keys, and uh, that was a great trip. Uh, I remember that because the motorcycles we rented were Sportsters, which were the perfect motorcycle for that occasion. The weather was beautiful being in Florida. It wasn't hot, too hot or too cold. And it was uh, just beautiful all over around. Um, I don't know if you've ever been to the Keys or not, uh, Chris, but it's a trip definitely worth doing. And we went through, I mean, you're doing you're doing this relaxed ride and there's no rush in the world and you're riding at your own pace. So you set your own uh, constraints there's no one rushing you. It's it's all dependent on you, how fast you want to go, and it's all at the flick of a wrist. And, uh, you know, I think that's one thing that really I enjoy being on a motorcycle is being carefree. Uh, you get to look around and you get to see everything happening around you, and I think it's one of the most uplifting moments for me. No doubt, man. I, now, I've never been to the Keys, the... Uh... The closest thing, I guess, for me for that was when we went to on our honeymoon to Maui, and we rented a bike for a day and just ri- yeah. just riding around the island and you know you're just going down these different you know roads and paths and just whatever you want to go down. on a bike you can just do it you know just just hey just take the bike and you can, sometimes you can go there places cars can't and yep that was a lot of fun and when I got back and turned the bike in and you know find out that it's like a little motorcycle gang that runs the bikes on the island so they i'm like uh you know i'm like i'm glad i didn't scratch your bike man (laughs) (laughs) yeah but uh but that's cool man i have to do that trip to uh on the keys on a bike next time that that sounds like a fun trip buddy yeah honestly i I hate flying and the only reason my wife can get me anywhere is if if there's a motorcycle trip planned somewhere Right at the end of it, I hear you. Now you, so since you're on the West Coast, you need to uh, plan you a trip out to Sturgis, and just I think you would enjoy that ride just for one, just to get out and you know in the in the mountains and the, to see that part of the country. But that'd be a fun one to do, man. Yeah, that'd be a, a, a you could probably make a big circle loop out of it and have a lot of fun. Yep, but, I hear you. Well, that's awesome, buddy. Well. Eco, we're one big family, buddy, and you know that. You know we we love and we love learning about you know our heroes and their families, what's going on. So, if you got a chance, this is your chance to kind of share with our listeners a little bit about your your family and and, and things in your personal life. Yeah, um, so I've been married for five years now. So my family, right now, my immediate family is my wife and I. We have two dogs that we pretty much treat like our kids. Uh, We don't have any kids yet. And pretty much anywhere we go, our dogs tag along with us, uh, long distance and short distance. We've done cross-country trips with them, and they are a lot of fun to be around. Uh, I know the stay-at-home is a really tough time for people, but having a family that I can can survive this through and survive this for really makes it worthwhile. Um, you know, any any difficulty that I go through, I'm always thinking about my wife and, you know, what's the best thing that I can do for her. And she does the same thing for me. So, you know, having that uh, symbiotic relationship is really great. Um, I remember before I was married, I didn't care about anything in the world. Uh, but now I'm, I'm always thinking about 
um, how it's going to affect her and, you know, if, if whatever I'm doing is the right thing or not. So I think it's made me a better person. Talking about Eco as a family, I still remember uh, everyone at Eco. I remember Anne-Marie at the front desk. I remember people in the shop. I remember, uh, I definitely remember you and Jeff. Uh, and I think about them often. Uh, I remember Carl Hunter. I remember uh, Willie. I remember. Do you remember the, uh, do you remember the tank not sitting? I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, to be honest, that yeah. wasn't entirely my fault. I was definitely part of that, but uh... <laughs> that was a fun. So, just for our listeners, I, we'll, we'll we'll keep this brief. But we had a tank we needed to move from one location to the other. Sarai was in charge of the project. Uh, we had an existing uh, hole that w- that we wanted to put the tank in, and uh, it came up what a half inch short, something like that. Half inch short. Yep. Yeah. So. Uh, I, I sent a letter, a strongly worded letter to NC State's graduate program of their mechanical engineering department saying that they maybe want to add, you know, r- how to read a tape measure into the curriculum a little bit. So I never heard back from NC State. So if you're at NC State uh-huh. listening to this, maybe hit us up as, and let us know if that's been added to your uh, ME master program. Yeah, but, I think but, they made some improvements recently. <laughs> it's part of their curriculum now. That's right, man. I, I I was telling Adam that story earlier. I said, you know, we were gonna when we got it in. I said I told Sarab I'm, I'm gonna get it decaled up with uh, with Sarab's face and an NC State emblem that says it will fit. You know, so uh, <laughs> that was a that was a fun memory though, man. I mean, we we had a lot of fun, yeah. and you know, Sarab, we uh, I've absolutely thoroughly enjoyed you know this this session with you sitting down and I think our listeners are going to really, hopefully they, they enjoy, you know, your story and you've, you've, you've done so many different things working for just a phenomenal company right now. That's impacting the world, you know, and, and hopefully we never have to, you know, experience your products, but if we do have to have that surgery and we, it's nice to know that uh, top, top of minds like you are behind the, the technology behind it. And we named this podcast eco Ask why for a reason, I always like to end up with, with, with the why question. So, you know, Sarab, why? why? Why do you enjoy what you're doing in your career, man? If you were trying to just to inspire somebody, what is your why? Because I believe in what the company does, you know, and I, I believe in what I do. And I believe that uh, whatever I'm doing right now has has a widespread outcome. It's not that I'm – it's not that the company is benefiting from this, but – Someone else is benefiting from the products that we build, you know, and that gives me uh, a sense of a pride. Um, it gives me a, a sense of where I fit in this whole world that I might have an impact on someone's life and make it better. So yeah, I think uh, that's one of the biggest reasons why I enjoy what I do. Every day I get up, it's I'm excited to go into work. Right. Well, that's that's great, man. I mean, and I think if, if you if you Stay focused on that purpose. You can't go wrong, and and I think you've you've probably inspired a lot of listeners out there right now, and to to make sure they understand their why and what you know why yeah. they're why they're you know driving to the job they're at, or maybe they're they're at on the job right now, and you know when you get that right, uh, things line up. So, Sarah, yeah. I've uh, I've been looking forward to this with you, and I'm so glad we were able to make this happen, and. You know, with with COVID happening, I just pr- you know pray that everything goes well for you and your family, and uh, just have really enjoyed uh, catching up and 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 recording this with you, sir. So thank you so much, buddy. Sure thing, Chris. I love talking to you. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad free by Electrical Equipment Company. ECO is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.